Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect you to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, which is where I work, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod. NOAA Live webinars will be offered most Wednesdays during the school year at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, this series is design, designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, and that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or they're one of our partners, I should say. Today, we're going to be introducing you to Stacy Robinson with NOAA's Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center on Oahu, and Wendy Marks with the Marine Mammal Center, K. Kaiola facility on the Big Island. Now, while we'll be talking about NOAA's role in monk seal research today, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Stacy and Wendy are coming to us from the ancestral Hawaiian lands and seas, and we are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina. Now, a few guidelines before I hand it over to Stacy and Wendy. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we wanna make sure that everyone can hear our speaker. However, the box where you wrote where you're from, you can also write questions. I'm going to be monitoring that the whole time. So we encourage you to write the questions as they, they come to your head and I will save them for Stacy and Wendy. And if you are a classroom, please let us know the name of the student who's asking the question. Our speakers are going to stop every now and then to answer as many questions as they can throughout the talk. All right, I know that you don't need to hear any more from me. You wanna hear all about Hawaiian monk seals. So I'm gonna hand it over to Stacy and Wendy. It's all yours. Thank you for that introduction, Grace, and thank all of you for joining us. I am so impressed to hear how far and wide people are joining us from. I'm really happy to be talking to all of you guys today about the Hawaiian monk seal and some of the work that NOAA and our partners are doing to try to help save this really special species. Um, and since I got to know a little bit about you guys and where you're from, I thought I would start with giving you a little bit of background on myself. Uh, this is a picture of me as a little kid appreciating some nature. I was always really interested in nature and the outdoors and animals, and that kind of started my my life as a scientist and of course I went to lots and lots of school. I went to college in Louisiana and studied wildlife biology and then I got a master's degree in Idaho studying um, uh, environmental sciences and then I got a PhD in Wisconsin studying wildlife ecology again and now I work here in Hawaii studying Hawaiian monk seals and so in this picture, this is me now in my current career, and this is one of the seal cameras that we captured back from a seal, and you're gonna hear all about this today. And these are some of the great folks that we work with and the whole team that is helping to recover the Hawaiian monk seals here in Hawaii. And so without further ado, let's talk about how this village of NOAA and our other partners are working to save the Hawaiian monk seal. So to start out with a little bit of history. So Hawaiian monk seals ranged throughout the Hawaiian archipelago. So the whole, the archipelago is that whole string of islands that were formed by volcanoes um, millions of years ago. And Hawaiian monk seals were throughout this area, but then about 800 years ago, the first Polynesian settlers, the first humans came to the islands. And of course, as um, when humans come in, often what happens is several extinctions follow after that. And so the monk seals were one of the animals that disappeared from the populated islands. But as you're going to find out, there are actually some really tiny Hawaiian islands up to the northwest that are still not populated because they're so small and just little sandy islands. So monk seals were able to, to stay living in those areas even after humans um, came to the main part of the islands. And so we just really started studying monk seals not all that long ago. The first surveys were conducted in the 1950s. And once we started surveying monk seals, we realized pretty quickly that the population was not doing very well. In fact, it was going down. And so in 1976, Hawaiian monk seals were one of the first animals listed under the Endangered Species Act, meaning that they were, we were 
you know, they were in danger of being lost from the planet. And so we needed to do something to help protect them. And so in the early 1980s, the NOAA Monk Seal program was put into place and we really started, you know, using research to understand what was going on with the population, to monitor the population and identify threats and things that we could do to help recover that population so that the monk seals would stay around for future generations. And so here is the Hawaiian archipelago I was just talking about, so the entire range of the Hawaiian monk seals. And you can see here we are out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, a very isolated area, but the area that we're working with, while it's tiny little islands, is actually a huge area spanning over 1,700 miles. So basically an area as long as the continental United States, but out here in the middle of the ocean. And so the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands are protected. This line shows the boundaries of, um, or the original boundaries of the Papahanao Makuakea Marine National Monument. And so that's a national monument that protects this marine area that encompasses a really large portion of the Hawaiian monk seals range. And in fact, most of the Hawaiian monk seal population is up in these tiny islands and coral reefs in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and that's about 1,100 seals. And then down here, we have what we call the main Hawaiian islands. These are the islands where people live, where you might have, you know, seen pictures of surfers or maybe taken vacation. And only about 300 monk seals live in the main islands. And there are, of course, survival threats to the monk seals that are what, part of what makes them endangered. And those threats differ across the area between the Northwesterns and the main islands. And so as you can imagine, the habitat in these areas is pretty different. The main islands, you know, where you guys have probably seen pictures like this with, um, with the big mount volcanic mountains and big sandy beaches. And then the islands in the Northwesterns were formed much earlier in geologic time. And so they've been eroding or breaking down for a long period of time. And so the islands in the Northwesterns are much smaller they're mostly um, low-lying, small, sandy islands. And so the habitat that monk seals have is quite different. Um, but they still have a lot of great underwater habitat um, to find fish to eat and things like that in both of these areas. And so some of the threats that face animals in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, one of those, of course, is climate change. With these islands being so small and so low-lying, they could be really impacted by sea level rise. And so that's one thing that we worry about. Also, even though this area is a protected marine national monument, and there's no big commercial fishing there now, but there's still a legacy of human impacts all throughout the ocean. And so some of this marine debris, old fishing nets and things like that are circulating, even in these really remote parts of the ocean, and monk seals have a tendency to get tangled in that marine debris, and that can be very dangerous for them. And then one of the other things that we see in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands is due to competition with a number of other predators, other seals, some of the young seals that are just kind of learning to feed themselves don't get enough to eat, and we see them in very bad body condition and basically not putting on enough weight to survive. And that's a really, um, unfortunate threat, but we're going to hear a lot more from Wendy later in today's presentation about some of the work that we're doing to try to combat that particular threat. In the main island, seals face pretty different conditions. Instead of these isolated sandy beaches, we of course have cities and people, and so human disturbance is sometimes one of the threats that seals face here. And then they also are threatened by certain diseases that come with the human altered environment and people's pets like cats can actually carry a dangerous disease called toxoplasmosis. And then of course, where seals are fishing in the same place people are fishing, there are sometimes accidents like you can see in this x-ray, a seal that swallowed a fish hook and those can be particularly dangerous. But of course, there's a lot of work that we do to try to improve survival and fight against these survival threats. And so one of the things related to that marine debris, sometimes if we are out in the field, we can actually find a seal that's entangled and we can remove that debris before it becomes too dangerous. A lot of time in the main Hawaiian islands, we're able to identify seals that have been hooked and we can remove those hooks. 
up in the top. This is our team. We've got a net over a seal's head and we are removing a hook just with a pair of pliers out in the field while, while some strong people are holding that seal down. But sometimes it takes something even more and we have a surgery facility here in Honolulu. And here we have some veterinarians with a seal under anesthesia trying to surgically remove a hook. So sometimes we have to go to really great lengths to try and help these animals. And then of course, when animals are not getting enough to eat out in the wild and we're seeing those animals in poor body condition, it's really difficult to alter the whole ecology of the food web out in the wild. But that's where our partners like Kay Kaiola come in and we can still do something to help those individuals that are struggling. Um, but first, one of the things we have to do is learn about that food web and what the animals need and what they need to eat and what will make them thrive. And so that's where some of the monk seal science comes in that I'm gonna talk about today. But first, why don't we pause and see if you guys have any questions about just sort of the general biology and status of the monk seals. Great, this is Grace from the chat box. Thanks for pausing, Stacy. So I encourage folks to write questions in that question box if you have any. I know you've probably got a lot about the monk seals. Um, but one of the questions that came in from um, Texas is, are monk seals only found in Hawaii? Hawaiian monk seals are only found in Hawaii and they're actually the only true tropical seal in the world. So they're really special, unique species. Um, there is a different species of monk seal called the Mediterranean monk seal. So they're, you know, they're kind of like cousin species. Um, and that species lives in the Mediterranean Ocean, like around um, Greece and Turkey and North Africa. And there used to be a Caribbean monk seal, but that seal unfortunately has gone extinct. Thank you. And Laura wonders, how old does a monk seal usually get? What's their average lifespan? The very oldest monk seal that we know about in the wild lived to be 32 years old. Um, most of them, probably more average, is to live like into their mid-20s or maybe late 20s, but occasionally we get one that's around 30. And yeah, Victoria, um, Sorry, and they keep having babies until usually like into their 20s. Nice. And Victoria and Liam have very similar questions. Victoria is wondering if they're related to the elephant seal, and Liam is is wondering what they're the closest relatives. I think they're thinking which which seal are they most like? Sure. Well, so the very most similar, of course, is going to be the Mediterranean monk seal because they're sort of in the same um, same grouping, and they are more distantly related to things like elephant seals and harbor seals, gray seals. And then you have like another big split and they're even more distantly related from things like sea lions and the type of, um, you know, sea lions that like you can actually see little ears on and they walk on their flippers a little more differently. Those are a more distant type of relative. Excellent. And if you're interested in learning more about the difference between marine mammals, we do have some other webinars. If you look for some of our marine mammal um, webinars to tell the difference. Um, so a couple of questions that are very similar, and I'm just going to shout out, I don't want you to answer because Stacy is going to get to this and I don't want to give it away. So all of you that are asking what they like to eat, like Natalie and Hannah um, and Anna, Stacy's going to get to that, so I just wanted to say that so people realize um, you're coming. But a couple of quick questions. So how many pounds are they? Like on average, what's their size? An adult monk seal will be around 300 to 400 pounds. Um, they can get up. I think the heaviest was like 600, but that's more like maybe a pregnant female. Um, Males and females generally look alike. They're pretty similar in size until the females start packing on a lot of weight when they're having a pup. Um, but most of the adults we see are probably between three and 400 pounds. Excellent. And then one other question, and then, and then I'll let you move on, is Michelle asks, can monk seals hear? Do they use, do they use their, even though you know they don't have the visible ears, do they still hear? They do still hear, and that's a really good distinction. They don't have the visible outer ears, like th these parts that we have, but they do have ears. Um, and so they are still able to hear. 
and even sometimes they they vocalize like you'll hear them you know kind of making barks or noises at each other above the water and in some of these underwater cameras we even sometimes catch them vocalizing under the water as well great i um i said i was going to let you go on this is the last question and then i'm not going to come back on i'll let you um take take it over but i i apologize if i'm pronouncing the name wrong but Keiko is asking, are you able to give new ID tags to the 2020 pups very soon? That's such a good question. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, as everyone knows, we're all impacted by the COVID virus. And so we haven't been out and about and doing as much field work as we normally do. But Keiko, we are actually able to do small things like send a couple of people out to put flipper tags on, um, on the monk seals here on the main island. Um, and so we are doing that. So we're hoping that we can get all of this year's pups tagged very soon. And for those that don't know, um, you can kind of see in this picture, a little white spot on this guy's flippers. We put uh, tags with little letters and numbers on the flippers of all of the seals, or at least as many as we can catch and handle. And those tags give a permanent identification to each animal so that we can recognize that animal when we see it again. And that's part of what we use to track how the animals are surviving, how many animals are in the population and which ones are in the population and you know surviving year to year so that we can figure out what's happening to those that aren't surviving. So yeah, that's a great question. And we are definitely kind of working double time to try and get as many tagged this year um, as possible since we had a little bit of a a gap in our field work um, with everything going on in the past year. Um, and so speaking of some of the research and field work that we that we do to try to understand Hawaiian monk seals, I will get on with talking about some of the cool work that we do to understand the foraging ecology of monk seals. And so when we talk about foraging ecology, really what we mean is how are they eating? Like how are they getting their food and and what are they eating how much are they eating and so some of the research questions that we have in these studies are we want to understand things like the habitat use so like what types of areas monk seals are using to look for food their dietary needs so like what types and how much food they need and then also their behavior and energy use like what they're what they're actually doing with their body to get food and how hard is it for them to get that food and how much energy do they have to put into that? And so one of the ways that we do this is with some pretty cool instruments that we call seal cams. Um, it's kind of like, and so we call these a multi-instrument camera. It's kind of like a fancy, sciencey um gopro camera with a fitbit attached that's going to let us see what the monk seals are doing and also take some measurements about like you know kind of like how many steps you take with your fitbit but it's going to be like how deep you're diving and how many times you swim after a fish for the seal and so in this picture you can see all these instruments that we're putting on so this right here has the camera and so that's got the camera plus the little fitbit part is inside of there and we also have a satellite telemetry tag. So that's going to give us GPS locations of the seal so that we can track where it goes. And then we also have this little VHF a radio location tag so that we can help find the camera and get it back from the seal. And so we put all of this on while we are, um, we capture the seal. You can see here it's got a net over its head. So we have a trained team and they very carefully capture the seal. We'll give it some drugs so that it's asleep and comfortable during this process. And all of this takes about 45 minutes to get the camera and the instruments on the seal. And then here you see a seal just relaxing and sleeping with the camera on. Um, and then after about a week, we get the camera back from the seal so that we can download all of that information and see what was going on. And so now I want to share with you guys one of the videos that we get from some of these seals. And this is our team, very, very happy whenever we get a camera back from the seals. You can imagine sometimes it can be hard to get. So our first video is from a seal called YR29. It's an adult male from French Frigate Shoals. That's one of those locations up in the Northwestern. And you could see on that map, those are all the locations of where this guy went. 
he tended to stay around this island called Churn Island. So we kind of called him the Churn Island Cruiser. And in this video, you can see the seal kind of, uh, kind of wandering after another seal, just, you know, kind of seeing what's up, maybe looking for, for another seal to hang out with. You can see they do interact underwater. And that's one of the cool things that we get to see with this video is, you know, how they eat, but also what else they're doing underwater aside from eating. And you can see these are some of the coral reefs down there. And then the next seal we're going to look at is a juvenile male. So this is a much younger seal. And you can see he started in French Frigate Shoals and actually went a lot farther all the way out to these other banks that were like 40 miles away. And this seal is actually diving pretty deeply down to some very deep water coral, about 200 feet deep. And you can see how he's kind of looking along the bottom and just keeps following the bottom and diving down. Monk seals are really specialized for finding food that's at the bottom of the ocean or at the bottom of the seafloor. We call that benthic foraging. Um, that ocean bottom is called the benthic area. And so you can see he just kind of goes along the bottom. Oh, you can see right now he's chasing something down. He's going to try to get this little fish. And the fish goes in this hole to hide. And the seal is still really good at finding that hiding food. And so, and of course, then they smash the camera all up against the rocks and try to damage our cameras and all that good stuff. But you can see how the seals are really good at trying to find those prey items that might be, you know, hiding in all those little nooks and crannies along the bottom. And they forage at night too. And the cameras luckily have a little bit of night vision so we can see even at night. And you can see, you know, there's, I can't tell what's in it, but you can see there's some little holes in this reef and the seal is trying to get something out of that hole. And he's trying so hard. And in this video, um, there were actually several clips. He would like go back up to the top and take a breath and then come right back down to this same hole, still trying to get whatever that is out. And you could see there a really large fish went by. They do have other large fish and sharks that they have to compete with. And then here he is just swimming through some really beautiful reef area with just a lot of a lot of a really thriving fish community there. And this is still um, up at French Frigate Shoals up in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands in that Papahanao Makuakea Marine National Monument. And now you can see he's starting to go up to the surface and then he's going to take a breath and then take a breath, relax a little bit, and then just go right back down for an, another dive. And so you can see where we get a lot of great information on that seal behavior from these videos. Um, a lot of good information about what they're eating, what they're doing down there. Um, yeah. And so are there any, any questions? about that. I know that was a pretty quick video, so probably a lot more questions than what I've answered already. So this is Grace from the chat box. And as I told you, Stacy, we have a very inquisitive crew. So I have a lot of um, questions. I'll, I'll I'm trying to do a couple here and then um, I think we'll be handing it over to Wendy. So I might save some for the end. But sure. um, Alice and Paul wonder how long the seals can stay underwater at a time. You know, the average is around like eight to 10 minutes for a dive, um, but they can hold their breath maybe as long as like 20 minutes, but 20 minutes would be more like if they're sleeping underwater, which they sometimes do. So if they're not being real active, of course, you know, that breath is going to last longer and they can stay down longer. But when they're being active and actually you know, chasing after food or digging around in the bottom for food, those dives are usually more like eight to 10 minutes. Great, and that leads right into the question again, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but I think it's Chen Ray. Where do they sleep? Mostly seals sleep up on the land. We call that hauling out. And so like if you, you know, for those that live in Hawaii or if you've ever visited, you might see a seal that's just lounging up on the beach. And you might wonder like, why on earth is it up on the land? And they come up on land so that they can, you know, relax and sleep without having to go to the surface every, you know, 10 or 20 minutes. And then usually it's safe from predators and things like that. And that's a really important time for people not to disturb them, you know, when they're in the populated islands because they do need that rest. Um, but they can sleep underwater too. So like, for example, 
that young seal that we just saw in the video that went to go forage at you know some coral reefs about 50 miles from shore that seal you know because that was a really long journey and so it was there for a few days and it would get tired and he would just go and sleep at the bottom for you know 10 15 minutes at a time and then come up for a breath and then go right back down and go back to sleep so they can sleep at sea too Great, interesting. I would love to see a sleeping seal. <laughs> um, all right, a really quick question from Victoria. Um, how many fish do they eat in a day? And a lot of people ask, what's their favorite fish to eat? Ah, oh, I wish I knew their favorite fish. Monk seals actually are a great example of having a very balanced diet. Um, they eat different species of fish from about 20 or 30 different fish families. Um, and that's partly because, you know, how I was saying monk seals are really good at finding the prey that are hidden along the bottom of the seafloor. Um, so monk seals really specialize in a style of catching prey, but not in any one particular species of prey. Um, so they do eat a pretty varied diet and they really just eat a few pounds of fish per day. So, you know, depending on how big the fish is that they catch, it might be several smaller fish or even just, you know, like one or two bigger fish. So yeah, so not that much per day. All right, last, I mean, we have so many questions because it's so interesting, but last question because we, Wendy has some amazing things to show us. Um, Rosie asks, what are the predators of the monk seals? And then Gabrielle is asking, do sharks eat them? Yeah, so, those are pretty related questions because sharks are pretty much the main predator, um, but mostly only really impacting like the really young seals. So sharks do eat some monk seal pups. Um, we sometimes see older monk seals with like a scar, they might get attacked by a shark, but when a monk seal is fully grown, it's very uncommon for them to get eaten by a shark just because, you know, they're such a large, large animal at that point. Um, but we do see sharks sometimes eating the young ones. And then sharks also compete with monk seals for the prey. So sometimes in these videos, what we'll see is sharks kind of following along with the monk seal, trying to steal that prey item once the monk seal finds it from its hiding spot. So there's a couple of different ways where, where those predators can impact the monk seals. Great, all right, at this point, um, I think we'll hand it over to Wendy, right? I think Stacy, that was the, the end, so I'm gonna, um make Wendy our presenter. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much, Stacy. All right, thank you, Stacy. And um, it's so nice to hear where everybody was tuning in from today. Um, all over the United States, I heard, and also a few people from Hawaii. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and where I'm from, um, and to share a little bit about my childhood. So here I am on the left, uh, about nine years old, vacationing on Maui. So I was actually born in Oregon, um, but my family decided to come on a trip out to Hawaii when I was probably in third grade. And although it wasn't my first experience uh, at the ocean, it definitely was a me the most memorable. Um, just being at the beach and swimming and having that experience. And so based off of that vacation, my parents actually made the decision to move out to Hawaii um, right after I finished sixth grade. So on the right here, I'm about 13 years old in seventh grade, I got certified to dive and I'm getting re ready to dive off the Kona coast. So um, that was another experience I had with the ocean. And then, you know, I learned to surf and um, we did a lot of snorkeling and I've just spent most of my life around the ocean and always had a passion for it. Um, and what's interesting is that although I had this passion for the ocean, I decided I was going to go to college to become a teacher. So I spent about 20 years in the classroom teaching students in elementary school and then eventually in preschool. So I lived on Oahu to go to college. So I've always been around the ocean from the age of 13 years old, always lived in Hawaii, went to college in Hawaii. Then I decided to move back to the Big Island. Um, spent some some more time in the classroom here. And then I decided, you know, I want to try something different. So I transitioned out of that and um, decided, you know, what tried started looking and I was like, what's out there? And I was like, here's an educator position with the Marine Mammal Center where I get to still teach kids, but I get to also share about my passion for the ocean, 
ocean conservation. And so I kind of made that transition a little bit later in life and that just shows you, you can, you can always change it up if you want to. Um, and I'll share with you, this is where I actually live. So on the left here, this is the Big Island. The Big Island is in the state of Hawaii. And right where that little pin drop is, um, that's Kona. And I live in Kona and I work in Kona. And here's a picture that I took on the right of the Big Island. It kind of shows you the landscape. So it's the newest island or the youngest island in the archipelago. And as you can see, it's made of, up of large mountains and um, lava. And we have an active volcano here. So it's a very interesting um, place to live. We have snow on the mountains and um, ocean all around us. And I absolutely love it. So that's, that's where I live. That's where I, I work. And I can show you a little bit more. I know Stacy shared um, this slide or a similar slide of the Hawaiian archipelago. So it includes the Big Island where I'm located all the way down here, all the way up to um, Cure Atoll. And so it's a very, like she said, an expansive area um, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And so Kei Ola is on the right here. So Kei Ola is actually part of the Marine Mammal Center. And some of you might be familiar with the Marine Mammal Center if you live in California, because our biggest facility is actually in Sausalito. And we are a marine mammal hospital. So we rescue um, sick, injured, marine mammals, we bring them in for rehabilitation. In California, they're rescuing a different species, but in Hawaii, we're actually rescuing Hawaiian monk seals, the endangered species that Stacy told you about. So our facility right here, Keikai Ola, was um, opened in 2014, and we are the only facility that's actually permitted by NOAA to treat sick and endangered Hawaiian, the sick endangered um, and also hurt Hawaiian monk seals. So we bring them into our facility with the help of NOAA. We treat them here with the goal of getting them back out into the wild population so they can help to repopulate the, the population that's already very small. Um, so today I'm actually going to share with you uh, two stories, two Hawaiian monk seal stories. The first one is the story of RA20. So here is RA20. She was actually born on the island of Kauai, um, but she moved, she swam all the way to the Big Island. So that's several hundreds of miles. So monk seals can swim really far. And um, RA20 is, is, she's out on the beach. She, she's doing her normal behaviors, foraging, looking for food, just like Stacy shared about. That's what monk seals spend most of their time doing is looking for things to eat. But RA20 was, it, it's an interesting situation because she um, was hauling out on the beach more often than usual. So we have, um, through the Marine Mammal Center and our Keikai Ola facility, we have a group of volunteers and staff members who are part of our response team. So this picture right here, you'll see one of our volunteers and over there where that arrow is, there's a circle, that's actually a seal. So we send volunteers out just to monitor the wild um, seal population on the Big Island. And so here's a volunteer and they're noticing that RA20 is, is hauling out more and more and more um, at the same location, which although it's normal for monk seals to haul out, it, it was a little bit more frequent than usual. And here's a closer look at um, our, what our volunteers do. They set up a seal awareness zone. So it's a sign with rope and it also um, helps um, beachgoers to know that there's a seal here resting and it, we have to keep our distance, right? Because remember, they're endangered species, they're protected by the Marine Mammal Act, um, and it is against the law to approach them, harass them, hurt them in any way. So here's RA20 hauling out, hauling out, and they were thinking, gosh, something really interesting is going on with this seal. So you might be asking yourself, like our volunteers and our scientists were, why was RA20 hauling out so often? And what happened was RA20 was actually pregnant and she was getting ready to have her pup. So here's a picture of RA20 with her very new pup. You'll notice that the pup is black, um, small, about 25 pounds, um, the weight of a small dog when they're born. And she was just looking for a safe place to have her baby. Um, and so what we asked the, the public on the Big Island, um, kids included, so if you're ever here on the Big Island, 
or anywhere in the state of Hawaii, we do have um, telephone numbers that you can call in these sightings. So the one on the top is actually our Marine Mammal Center response number. So that's only if you're on the Big Island. And then the one on the bottom is the Hawaii Statewide Marine Animal Stranding Entanglement and Reporting Hotline. So if you're visiting, say, and you're on the island of Oahu or Kauai or Molokai, this is a number that you can call and they will send somebody out to first check if the seal is okay, um, and then probably monitor and just stay on the beach and, and engage with people who are visiting to share about this very endangered species. Um, so that was kind of a fun and exciting event that happened, and we call that a pupping event. Um, and RE20 has actually had two pups on the Big Island, and those um, seals are now grow, you know, grown. They're a few years old, and they, they stick around the Kona area, and they're seen quite often. So I want to pause there, um, Grace, and see if there's any questions in the chat box. Yes, this is Grace from the chat box. Thanks for pausing, Wendy. I will just mention, too, before I share the questions, that if you go to the NOAA Live website under our listing for this talk, you can find the Marine um, Animal Stranding Network. So no matter where you live in the United States, you can find the number to call because just like Wendy's organization is um, there to to help rescue in their area, there are people all um, along the coastline in the U.S. that are that are ready to um, rescue stranded and hurt marine animals. So you can find those numbers on the website. Okay, so first question for you, Wendy, comes in from Anthony. What are baby monk seals called? Great question. Um, sometimes they're called black coats because as you saw in that picture when they're first born, they're covered in black fur. Um, but most times we just refer to them as pups, very similar to like what you would call a, um, a baby dog. <laughs> Excellent. Um, a lot cuter than my baby dog, I have to say. <laughs> um, Colton, Colton asks, because you were talking about monk seal interactions, if monk seals interact with people, are they dangerous or are they friendly? Well, we have to remember that monk seals are wild animals, just like similar to a tiger or a bear. Um, those are not animals that you would approach in the wild and we need to treat monk seals the same way because they are, they are dangerous. All wild animals can be dangerous and we wanna make sure that people are safe and seals are safe. So it's best not to approach them. Um, there's a rule of about 50 feet, but it's, it's difficult when you're out on a beach to determine how much is 50 feet. So oftentimes we'll um, teach people to use their thumb and stretch their arm out straight in front of them. And as long as their thumb can cover the seal, they're a good distance away. Yeah, never approach a monk seal. Great, and I, and I will share that that's true. Again, if you're in another part of the country, if you see a marine mammal, if you see any kind of seal on the beach, to use Wendy's rule of thumb, I, I love that. Um, all right, last question before we move on comes from Jillian. Jillian's wondering how many monk seals are you currently treating in your facility? Really good question. Um, right now we don't have any patients on site. Uh, that's mostly or primarily due to the pandemic. Um, we rely heavily on NOAA's uh, assistance and partnership and they're the ones who run the vessels that go up to the northwestern Hawaiian Islands that Stacy shared about where about 1100 seals are right now um, and they rescue those sick and injured monk seals and they bring them back but they're not running their vessels right now so we currently do not have patients on site. Our last cohort of four patients left us in um, early August and went back on a Coast Guard plane to Midway where they were released back into the wild. Great, well, it's it's sad to think we can't come see them, but I think very heartening to know that you don't have patients, that everyone is healthy and back in the wild. Um, yes. All right, I'm going to pause there. There are always so many questions, but I'll hold on to any that we have, and I know you have a lot to share with us, so please continue. All right, so we'll move on to the next patient. Um, and uh, although RA20 wasn't a patient, uh, this seal was. Her name is, uh, was Mea Ola. And Mea Ola is one of those seals that was rescued from French frigate shoals. 
So that is part of Papahanao Mokuakea, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. It is a marine national monument. So it's a marine protected area. And she was rescued by those NOAA vessels, those NOAA researchers that I just told you about. Um, and the reason she was rescued is when the field researchers were out, they noticed, as you can see in this photo, she was very emaciated. So emaciated means very, very skinny. You can see her bones. This is not what a monk seal should look like. Um, you saw the picture of RE20 and how nice and plump and healthy she looked. Um, Maya Ola what only weighed about um, 92 and a half pounds, but she actually should have been more like 200 or more pounds, um, like the size of, or the weight of a refrigerator or a washer. And right here in this picture, she was weighing about the same as a large dog. So very skinny, but what they noticed was she was foraging, she was finding food, she was eating, but for some reason she was not gaining weight. So scientists always have to ask them, themselves, what's going on? Why could this be? And if they can't determine out in the field on a beach what's happening, then our facility, that's when we come in and we help. So they decided we got to transport her to um, the Marine Mammal Center, Keikai Ola Hawaiian Monk Seal Hospital, and we need to find out what's going on with Mia Ola. So she was brought to us, and you might be asking yourself, why was she so skinny? If she was eating, why wasn't she gaining weight? Well, unfortunately, Mea Ola had two worms. She had two types of worms in her body. She had tapeworms, which are an intestinal worm, and she had round worms, which are stomach worms. So here's um, a photo of, or a, a um, picture of the different types of worms that animals and people can get. And so I'm gonna um, stop sharing my screen because I want to show you an actual tapeworm. We have a specimen. And Grace, can you see me large now so I can share the specimen? Perfect, Wendy. Okay, uh, so right here, this is an actual tapeworm. This is one tapeworm. And you're probably thinking, ooh, that's one worm. It's, it looks so long. Well, tapeworms can be anywhere between six and 20 feet. And if you think about 20 feet and you might wonder how long is that or how tall is that, that's the height of an adult giraffe. So one tapeworm can be 20 feet long and could be inside someone's intestinal tract. And so unfortunately, Mea Ola, she had tapeworms and she also had round worms. Now you can tell that those are much smaller and they're um, a bunch of individual ones. So those were the, what was inside of her stomach. So at Keikai Ola, she was given medication to rid her body of the worms. She was fed a, a nice diet of fish that um, she needed for nourishment and to put weight back on her body. And I can share happily that after several months of rehabilitation at our Keikai Ola hospital, this was Mea Ola after, before she was released back into the wild. And she weighed 371 and a half pounds. So she was in this picture, probably the weight of a baby elephant. So she went from the weight of a small dog to the weight of a baby elephant. And I have a pretty cool comparison. So, Wendy, I hate to interrupt you, but we're not seeing your slides yet. If you share your slides with us, then we'll, I'm as eager as the kids to see. Oh, there she is. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah. So. Here she is, you can tell huge difference, right? She went from, like I said, the size of a large dog to the size of a baby elephant. And then here is a, a pretty amazing side-by-side -side comparison, before and after. So she gained 279 pounds while she was in care at our hospital. Um, and she was so large that, you know, she has to be transported back um, and re released back at French Frigate Shoals. So it's pretty difficult when there's a seal weighing that much. So she definitely ate a lot of fish and um, was super healthy and ready to go back into the wild. So I'm going to pause there and see if there's any questions in the chat box, Grace. Excellent, of course there are questions, Wendy. We have a very savvy, inquisitive group. So uh, one question that came in from Juan is, how do you, how did you transport Mea Ola? 
Oh, great question. So I wasn't part of that transportation, but I was involved in our most recent cohort of patients when they went back to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So it takes it takes a village, just like um, we named this webinar, it takes a village. So we had um, our staff members and we had a group of volunteers who got together, um, did some super heavy lifting. We uh, used something called herding boards that move the animals around to get them into like big dog crates. So if you think about a crate that you might take your dog to the veterinarian in, um, we have huge crates for these really big seals. And then we had to get a forklift here. They had to put the forklift onto the truck. Um, the truck had to drive to the airport, which is located very close to the Marine Mammal Center in Kona. And then we had to meet a Coast Guard plane. And then we had to do the forklift again and put the crates on the Coast Guard plane. Um, and then that plane transported seals back. That was a great question. Sounds like an exciting process, I have to say. Um, <laughs> and then this question is a more general question, but I think we've all been wondering it. Angela's wondering, why are they called monk seals? Ooh, that is a good question. And you know, if you would have asked me this a year, a year and a half ago, even though I've lived in Hawaii for most of my life, I would not have known this answer. But because I work at the Marine Mammal Center and they taught me this in some of my training, they are called monk seals because if you think about um, people who are monks, so they practice a certain religion and they wear um, these robes, these big hooded robes that kind of like um, are are all the way around their head so they're not tight like a like a hoodie but they're large and then they drape down their bodies monk seals got their name from monks so if you think about the hood and then you look at a monk seal with like its you know head and then it's um you know flaps of blubber and and skin with fur they look a lot like a monk Great, that was my guess, but I had never heard. So now I, I have learned something new as well. Thank you for that. Um, last question that comes in from Jennifer is, um, how did Mayola get the worms? How, how do all seals have worms and how does that happen? That's another good question. Um, and that was a question I also had, like why, why do monk seals get these tapeworms? Because it is pretty common in monk seals. Um, and it's because they're eating, like Stacy shared, they're eating a raw seafood diet. So out in the ocean, right, they're all the seafood are live. It's live fish and live lobsters and you know whatever live that they can find, they're eating it. And so typically if that's all that a seal is eating, they're going to have some presence of tapeworms. Not such a problem because their body can rid it on their own. But if they've gotten an accumulation of tapeworms, too many for their body to take care of, that's when they need intervention and medication to rid their body of those worms. Great, thank you for answering all those questions. I'm going to hold on to the rest because I know you have some more fun things to share with us. So if you can continue on, that'd be great. All right, so moving on, um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna talk to you about enrichment for seals. So enrichment for seals, this is, is a photograph with some little model manipulatives that we've created um, that are similar to the enrichment devices we use with patients on site. So you might ask yourself, what, what is enrichment? And the way I would describe it is um, at school, if you're playing a game or, or doing something that you're enjoying, but at the same time you're learning something, so maybe it's a board game and you really like playing that game, but you're learning some math skills or some reading skills, or you're learning facts about some scientific subject that you're studying in school, that's what I would say is enrichment. So that's enrichment for people. For SEALs, enrichment is a little bit different, right? Because they're, they're not needing to know math or how to read. Their um, skill that they need to know is foraging, finding food and being successful in doing that. So when a lot of our patients come into Keikai Ola, they are skinny like Mea Ola. Um, some of them are pre-weaned from their mothers. So that means that they didn't nurse long enough and um, they are too skinny and weak to actually get out in the ocean and find food. And then they're here with us for several months um, through rehabilitation. 
they need to have some kind of interaction with devices that are teaching them how to forage. So I'm going to um, show you one more picture. So these are some of the things that we have. Um, this is the fish feeder on the right. So this is something we would drop into the bottom of the pools and there would be fish inside, but you see there's lava rocks on the top. So this is teaching a seal um, how to lift things up, look inside of things just like they would be doing out in the ocean if they're looking in caves and crevices and coral reef areas for their food so that's what the fish feeder does um, and then we have the coral reef the fish sickle and i'm going to stop sharing my screen in a couple seconds so i can actually show you these up close the jolly egg ohia log and a pvc float and then live fish, octopus, lobster, and sea cucumber. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And Grace, can you see me um, larger so I can show these? Perfect. Okay, so the first one is the coral reef right here. Um, and the coral reef is really like um, melt crates. We, this is a smaller version. Um, and what we would do is um, we have frozen herring that we thaw out um, and we put the, it inside the crate and we might drop the crate onto the floor of the pool where we're keeping our patients or um, maybe into the water and they have to try to get the fish out of these different um, holes where they're at. So this is another device that would teach them good foraging skills um, looking in caves and crevices out in the ocean. And then I mentioned um, the fish sickle. So this is a fun one. Uh, think of it like a popsicle, right? But fish flavor. So what we do is we freeze, um, we put those frozen fish into water and then we, we freeze it and it comes out in a cube. And then we'll roll these out onto um, the, the floor of the pool deck next to the pools. And the seals have to try to um, bite at um, the ice cube and get to the fish inside. And so I'll show you, we have a replica skull, so not a real skull, but it, sh it shows you how they, monk seals have really sharp teeth. So they're, they are good at biting at that fish sickle and getting to the fish inside. But once they get the fish, they don't chew it up and swallow it like people do. They actually um, just swallow it whole because monk seals do not have a gag reflex like humans. So that's something that's a little bit interesting. Um, if you watch them eat, you're like, why, why aren't they chewing it? But yeah, the fish tickle is fun. And although they're not going to encounter like snow and ice in Hawaii um, out in the ocean, it's just another thing that they have to like, like I said, enrichment, figure it's fun for them, but then they're learning at the same time how to get their food. Um, another one is the Jolly Egg. So this is a small version. We have larger ones. This is something just floats around in the pool and it helps them with moving things out of the way. Unfortunately, in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, um, there's a lot of marine debris on the shoreline and um, sometimes seals do get entangled in that, but they might need to move something out of the way to get to their food. Could be a lava rock, it could be marine debris, unfortunately. So um, this is another device that we use. And then um, I mentioned the PVC float. So we have a smaller version and it really is just these PVC pipes fit it together and we float that in the pool. It gives them something to move around and engage with. And then um, some of their favorite things too, these are not live, but we have some partners here next to our organization um, that have octopus. So there's an octopus farm, there's a lobster farm. And um, every so often we will get some live fish and some live octopus and lobsters that we feed to our patients on site. So it's kind of a gradual process. They might go from tube feeding or just eating the frozen fish we have, and then we wanna give them live fish because that's what they're gonna encounter out in the ocean. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. And I wanna just show you a couple fun pictures of our patients engaging with some of these devices. Um, Grace, I just wanna make sure that you can see the screen. Yes, I can, thank you. Okay. All right, so here on the left, we have three of our patients that um, were just here up until August, and they're engaging um, with a melt crate. And you can see that inside of the melt crate, this is where those um, herring that we defrosted are placed. So this 
you can see the seal is being successful in finding it. This seal seems to have found one on the top. And then they pull this out and um, that's how they get maybe their breakfast for the day. And then on the right here, we have um, another one of our patients and it's really silly, but in her mouth, <laughs> she has a sea cucumber. And it's, it's fun because we are located right next to the ocean. So we will go out into the tide pools and actually get some of these sea cucumbers um, right out front of our facility. So it's nice that we have access to that because they really enjoy um, having, having that food. It's a treat for them. Um, and then I have one final fun thing to share with you. And that is a video of one of our patients uh, chasing live kampachi. So we have a kampachi farm. It's out in the ocean, the open ocean, very close to our facility here. And um, they every so often will donate live kampachi fish for our patients to have. And so this is the ultimate goal right here is we use all of these enrichment devices. Um, and once they're successful in that, we introduce live prey for them because we want to make sure when they go back out, they are ready to do that same thing in the ocean. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this and I think it's gonna work. Ah, oh, it is, okay. So there's no sound, so I'll just narrate. As you can see, the fish is right there. The seal is um, on the chase tracking it pretty well and right about here she's going to catch it when she circles back around again right there oh no <laughs> she she's gotten close a few times but um you know just observing this behavior there, she got it right there where she's rolling. This is success. So she's got it in her mouth, chewing it a little bit, and like I said, swallowed it whole and it's gone. So that's, that's we love to see that. We know that she's, she's getting ready to be back in the wild. Um, okay, so that's all I have to share. But I want to see if there's any last questions, Grace, before we end today. We had a few questions come in um, that I think would be lovely if you have a few minutes. So Anthony wonders, when do they get released back into the wild? I guess, like, what's what tells you that they're ready to be released? Well, typically, it's it's weight gain. Um, their behavior, there's a, a variety of factors. That's such a good question. I wish I could have shown you some of the slides, some before and after, you know, how skinny some of the patients are, how much weight they've gained. Um, but it typically is, you know, it's a discussion that our um, animal care staff is having on site, very close communication with NOAA, people like Stacy and her team. And deciding, okay, what is the behavior that the seal is showing? Is the seal ready to go back? Is is it going to be successful? Um, and it's a it's a big, huge process. But that's a great question. You know, we're not going to re release a seal that's skinny and not eating on its own for sure. But um, we have a lot of healthy patients that leave here, and they're ready to go out and, and be on their own. And um, just so people know, because some folks are asking, we will share that video. I think we um, are able to share that the link to that video. So if it was choppy on the this when I was showing it, you can take a look at that video later. Um, an interesting question that came in from Isabella is how big are their colonies? So monk seals, do they tend to hang out um, by themselves or do they tend to be in the big rookeries we see with some of the other species? And that either to, to Wendy or Stacy. Wendy, if you want, where you can hand it off to Stacy. Oh, I think that's a great question because a lot of people are really used to seeing like elephant seals, um, maybe in California, and they are in these big colonies. Monk seals are much different. They're, they're definitely solitary creatures. Um, the moms, after they have their babies, they're usually spending four to six weeks on the beach nursing them. And then moms are off and babies are on their own. And so babies have to learn how to forage and find their own food. So typically you're not going to see like a huge colony of monk seals. I don't think that's something that um, 
ever happens, but maybe you'll see a few playing together like in the tide pools or out in the water or even up on the, on the sand. Excellent. Thank you so much. So Darian asks a really interesting question. Which one of the enrichment devices do the seals tend to learn the quickest? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, well, I can tell you that this one is probably makes them the most curious, right? Because it's cold and the texture and they're not sure what to do with it. The same with like the live lobster and, and the fish. Um, I'm going to take a guess, but Stacy can also, if she knows anything about enrichment, I would say something like um, the coral reef, because typically before they've, um, when they're free feeding, so free feeding is when they've moved off of tube feeding to us providing them with these um, frozen and defrosted herring, they're able to eat the fish. So this is just like the next level, pulling these fish that are typically like thrown over to them now they're pulling them out of a device like this so this would probably be the easiest for them to start with excellent yeah. all right i think I'll, oh go ahead oh i was go gonna ahead. say you know it's pretty cool like now that we've been putting these cameras on seals and like you saw today we do some that are older seals and some that are younger seals and we do see some behavior differences and some feeding style differences between the younger seals and the older seals and one of the things we do see is like the younger seals have a tendency to go chasing after things a lot more and the older seals maybe are a little better at just like pinning it down and getting it out of a hole and so they're not chasing things as much so yeah so i agree things that are you know teaching teaching these young seals to like figure out how to get prey out of tricky spots seems to probably really serve them well in the type of feeding that they do in the wild so I would challenge all of the kids out there to think about all the games you probably play at school and without even realizing it, you're learning skills that um, you'll need as an adult. So I don't think that just happens with SEALs in rehab. Um, okay, one last question because I, I see that our, our time is up. And um, Natalie asked, do your SEAL patients, do they have different favorite enrichments? Do they tend to like one more or another? And do they have different personalities that you can observe when they spend that time in your rehab facility? Very good question. And yes, definitely. Like if you think about um, dogs, like no two dogs have the same personality, the same for like monk seals. What's really cool about our facility here is that we, we work with a cultural advisor and although seals are typically they're tagged and um, referred to by their tag numbers our cultural advisor will come in and she'll observe the seal behavior for a few hours and then provide them with hawaiian names that kind of describes um, their personality best so i think that's a, a really good description of like how different their personalities can be and yeah for sure um, seals on site like i'm thinking back to our last cohort of patients um, we had one that just loved to get live sea cucumbers, and she would just play with those for hours and hours and hours before she would eat them. And then there would be another one that was more into like the devices where you had to lift up a lever and find the fish, and it was a little bit more challenging. So um, it, it's really interesting. If you're able to observe them over time, you will notice the differences um, and sometimes the similarities as well. Good question. Again, similar to students in your classroom, probably, right? You all have different things that, that excite you and uh, different personalities. Well, I'm sad to say that um, our time is up, but I know a lot of questions came in and we talked about maybe doing a, um, answering a few questions, putting them on a document and sending that out. So if your question wasn't answered, we'll see if we can answer some of those and maybe send out a follow-up email. But I just wanna thank you, Wendy. Sorry for the technical problems, but thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Stacy. thank you so much for sharing that amazing video and, and your expertise. It was really exciting to learn about the Hawaiian monk seal today. And thank you for all our viewers for your patience. And we're so glad you were with us. And if you want to join us next week, our NOAA Live will be on, um, we're calling it dam busters. So what we find out when we remove dams and how that helps the fish that spend part of their life in the ocean and swim up to freshwater ponds and then swim back, 
um, particularly river herring and eels and how removing dam can impact their journey. So that's next week, um, Wednesday at four. But thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon, depending on where you are, or evening, if you're where I am. Thanks so much. Thank you.